Um, next up is going to be Chip, um, as well as John McBride from the Sopris Foundation, um, speaking about vanishing common sense. I'm uh, quite interested in that topic because I think common sense is pretty important. But basically, we're going to be talking about disappearing farms, ranches, forests, and public lands. And we'll see what that topic means. So uh, this is my uh, reaction to the lights that are. Plus, I want to. When I'm with when I'm with John McBride, I have to kind of look cool because, uh, you know, it's a. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, I'm uh, really looking forward to this this uh, uh, talk with John. John McBride is uh, not only a, a dear friend and a longtime uh, supporter of AREI and uh, our day, but he's also one of the the leaders of the, uh, <clears throat> the the conservation awareness in the valley. And John and I want to talk to you today about a very specific issue in the state of Colorado that really is affecting us all and it ties right into water and energy, and that's land use. Um, we have a, a situation here in Colorado where if you uh, uh, have land, and, it, uh, and, and this particularly impacts our farmers and ranchers, um, remember, you know, Colorado was based on a, an agricultural uh, economy uh, for, you know, 100 years before we got into the modern era and tourism kind of took over, and so when land is now um, uh, passed on, uh, what was uh, taxed at $40 uh, an acre and all of a sudden jumps to, to 200, I mean to 20,000 because uh, uh, it, it, there's a, a law that went in that allows a 35 acre parcel. Didn't Mike Strang, by the way, your buddy, uh, facilitate that? And I think he was a Republican, but I'm not sure anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the point is it's putting a lot of financial stress on families and they end up losing their land to the developers. And so John, you know, can you frame this a little bit for us? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> can you hear me all right out there? Um, we live on a cattle ranch about 20 miles that way on the other side of the ridge uh, from Snowmass. And uh, we run about 150 cows and put up 450 tons of hay. It's just a small ranch operation that's been going on for years and years and years. Because of certain public policies, I would say it's doomed. It will eventually, one way or another, become subdivision. In fact, it's my opinion that the whole state will. Uh, I'm a pilot. I've flown all over the state from Durango and Cortez up to Meeker, Paonia, all over. All of our valleys are being dotted with homes all over the place. And the reason primarily is Senate Bill 35, which was passed about 25 years ago. It was designed to help farmers and ranchers who were having a hard time paying their mortgage and expenses so that they could sell off a piece of land without going through local jurisdiction at all. The end result has been that all ranch properties are now valued as though they were a rural subdivision. So while somebody may have paid $500 or $1,000 for ranch land years back or inherited it, when they gift it or pass it on, it will not be valued for what it is. It will be valued for a rural subdivision. In the case of our own ranch, uh, the county assessor values it at a, the ranch land at about $30 an acre. Under the estate tax, the way it's set up now, in the state, because of Senate Bill 35, it could be valued at $20,000 an acre. So a, any ranch that's not a particularly good business is doomed. And uh, the federal government comes along because of Senate Bill 35 and the fact we have no agricultural zoning at all. Federal government will value it at the time of gift or estate tax at the so-called highest and best use. Uh, and it's doomed. So it's, it's a real tragedy for the state. We live in one of the most beautiful places in the world and rather than preserving our open lands and farmlands, we have public policies which encourage the destruction of them for what they are and turn them into subdivisions. 
Consequently, everybody is burning a lot more carbon, and we will more and more in the future. So that's our problem. Yeah, and that, that ties directly into the last panel because as we develop the land in Colorado, that, that means that we need uh, more water, and that's becoming a critical, critical issue on the Front Range. And of course, they want you know water from the Western Slope, which they already get a lot of through, through our, uh, I think there's 11 pipelines that go from here to there. Uh, filling up reservoirs. So, so how do we um, address that besides rescinding, you know, SB 35, which has been on the books for uh, <clears throat> quite a while? Um, you know, and by the way, let's let's duly note that when we break up these ranches into these 35-acre parcel, that gives us, you know, the McMansions that we're seeing all over this end of the valley. Uh, and these homes are, are enormous, and they're generally utilized only a few months out of the year, if that. But they're sitting there consuming all of this power uh, and, and continuing to exacerbate this problem. Well, short of getting rid of Senate Bill 35, which, of course, I think we should, we should carefully look at the fact that uh, farm and ranch land is valued not for what it is, but for what it might be. And I don't think there is any other asset in a person's estate that is valued that way. There seems something extremely immoral to me about that. Um, if you were to value your house or your stock portfolio the same way, the government could say, well, if you put a new roof on and put a few additions on your house and maybe a newer staircase or what have you, it would be worth a lot more. So we're going to use that value. Or if you have stock in Inland Steel and they did a better job of manufacturing and shipping and what have you, their, their stock could be worth more. So that's what we're going to use. That's what they do with farms and ranches. They say, look, even though you have a simple farm and ranch, it could be a subdivision with 50 houses on it, 5,000 square feet each. That is particularly odorous near a resort community, but it's true in the Peonias and the Durangos and Meekers and all over the West. It's the same, same thing. I'm a pilot, I have a small airplane, I fly around. I cannot believe the speckling of, air, of, of homes all over the West now. And it's, it's only going to get worse with this legislation in place. Uh, I don't know if anybody can get to the government and say, look, you, why don't you value property for what it is, like the county assessor does, and then if your children or grandchildren want to convert the family farm or ranch to a subdivision, hit them big time with a conversion tax. Great. If that's what they want to do, hit them with that. But don't do it in advance of that, which causes the conversion. So, okay, we're in, a, <laughs> we're in a situation here that it sounds like we need to have some sort of a, uh, a referendum or, or a public awareness campaign. And, um, I, you know, with all of these other issues, you know, that, that we need to address, I mean, how do we, you know, what, is there a good mechanism? Um, you know, what do you, have you been thinking about this a long time? I mean, I, we had this conversation I think at our day in 2008, and has anything changed since then? Doesn't seem to. I mean, this particular valley seems to be driven by real estate sales, so there's a huge amount of momentum to uh, continue uh, selling more and more bigger prices and so forth. We do have a TDR program, which I don't think works as well as it should, where you can sterilize land and take the, tr the development rights, transfer them supposedly to the more urban centers, but they've allowed it to go into bigger houses in the country. So what we're really kind of creating in a way is um, medieval Italy and raising pl prices for everybody. Uh, not too far from where we live, there are two huge houses. Well, first of all, our neighbor had 1,250-acre ranch. Ten years ago, he had to sell half the ranch to pay the real estate, uh, the, the uh, estate tax. The, on the land he sold, we built three homes, two of them over 7,000 square feet. Neither one has ever been occupied. So it's kind of speculative, and it's just crazy what that's done. 
And as we do, as we suburbanize more and more of the state in our valley and other valleys, we're doing more and more damage to wildlife and uh, causing, throwing more and more carbon in the air. Even if these houses sit empty, they gotta be heated. And then when the people arrive, there's UPS trucks and gardeners and masseuses, it never stops. So we have, ro <laughs> we have roads everywhere and it's, it's so insane. Um, some people say the conservation easements might help, maybe in a small way, but they're like 1% of the land. And in fact, we've got a phenomenon here in our valley where land that's conserved, conserved and then has a big house on it will sell for an immense amount. And the, what was hay fields may be just considered a giant lawn. Um, so I, I don't know. I think that we've got to get back to a good program of TDRs, but really the best thing we could do, in my opinion, is look at the European model. The Europeans revere the fact that they've got farm and open land and they protect it. If you have a farm, let's say in France or Germany or Switzerland, typically, and you want to sell it, the buyer cannot tear down the house and build a new one. All he can do is remodel it. And there may even be a payment if you maintain a certain landscape. Uh, and if you drop dead, your land will, being a farm, will be zoned farm. It will be valued at roughly, say, 3,000 a hectare, and you have to pay 5% of that to transfer it. There's no need for a conservation easement at all. They don't have conservation easements in Europe. They don't need them because they zone the property what it is and they make sure that it stays that way. So they see great value in a landscape that's rural and open and farms and ranches and, and keeping it that way and maintaining it. Um, a few years ago, we flew in a light airplane from London to Geneva and I was sitting next to the window. We flew the whole way to 1,000 feet through Rem and Dijon and that area too, across the channel to Geneva. And the whole way, looking out the window, I did not see one rural subdivision. You might see uh, orchards, vineyards, town, uh, nothing, and then farms, and, and just no rural sprawling subdivisions. And we did it last year, flying from Pau to Paris in an airplane, same thing, 40 towns, no rural subdivisions. So maybe we, I mean, we still have a frontier here in America where it's my land, I can do what I want with it, but we've got to get over that. We've got to get, start getting intelligent if we're going to live without wasting and burning excess carbon, if we're going to protect our landscape for what it is and for the wildlife. Um, and I don't know where to go. Now we've got. Tim Worth in the room, and he, he needs a job, and he'd be a wonderful one to <laughs> spearhead this. Well, I think, uh, uh, Tim, John is nominating you for a new position, and you know we hope that you'll take it, uh, being one of Colorado's great leaders. Um, I want to take the last you know 40 seconds here to, to talk, to just transition from land use into public transport and a very issue that you and I talk about a lot and that is this traffic congestion in this valley is horrible, it's getting worse by the day. Why can't we do something smart like go and put in a small train system that goes from the airport into town? I mean, is, is, what's the problem? I mean, Aspen has this enormous, you know, economy and a big budget and Picking County. I mean, isn't there a way that we can uh, you know, and, and I, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to cut you off here because you've got 20 seconds to, to address that, but, um, you know, you brought up Europe, and they seem to have solved this public transport. Well, they're a little smarter than we are. Uh, a few years ago, we went to watch some World Cup races in Wangen, Switzerland, and we land in Zurich and say, how do you get to Wangen? It's 95 miles away. You take this train to Bern that's right under the terminal, and then you go to Interlaken, and then you get another one up to uh, Wangen, so we did this, everything was on time, we couldn't believe it. Got to the, uh, the station, couldn't find our bags. Oh my God, I go, got to get up to the little hotel, get a ride up there and go to the room and see if I can make some calls to find the bags. The bags are in our room, 95 miles away. We can't do it from our Aspen airport to Aspen, which is three miles away and 3.2 miles 
to, to Snowmass. I mean, really. We're going to redesign our airport, and we've been talking about the benefit of a 1,500-car underground parking garage for rental cars. I mean, really. So we've got a lot we can learn from Europe, and a lot of us are pushing for it, and I hope we can do a lot better than we have so far. Well, I guess, uh, you know, that's it, folks. I mean, you know, we've just got to uh, uh, smarten up. <laughs> I think that's pretty much what we're talking about. You bet. So, you bet. okay, well, thanks so much, John, for all your uh, Thank you. great thoughts.